Okay, we are we are live now, Dave. So hi everyone. <clears throat> we'll see as everyone starts to jump on board here. Let's see. Yeah, what is that? You're about like what is it about noontime already for you right now? Yes, it's um eleven forty seven PM. <clears throat> so we're um just about lunchtime. Once we finished here, I'll be having my daily coffee. Uh get me through the rest of the day, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to. <clears throat> oh, so, boy. Yes, what, about, what time is it for you? About 6, 7 o'clock, is it? <clears throat> Roughly. Yeah, we're going to hit that 6 or 7 o'clock time frame. Uh, those of you now, finally joining us. Holiday. Oh, here you go. Our your world holiday, day, uh, the 4th of July is tomorrow. The 4th of oh, July. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're in the future. <laughs> I should ask you for the lotto numbers. I've always wanted to ask about that or <laughs> ask about the direction that the toilet spins, flush it. Does it go the opposite direction? It does, yes. <laughs> <I'll check>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, There's a few starting to pop in now. Rager. We've got 24 people on the chat. Guys, uh, again, welcome to our live stream. Uh, we are at our pre-show right now, getting uh, Dave warmed up for the show, or getting me warmed oh, up yeah, for the I'm show, I guess. Up. No. I need to be, it's pretty cold here. <laughs> Jason Vong, what's going on, man? Uh, Jason, how you going, mate? You're the anime expert. Yeah, I was just at uh, Comic-Con on the weekend. I had an absolute ball with those uh, strange people. I actually loved it. People dressed up everywhere. It was so funny. Uh, I took about 30,000 photos, but only with my iPhone. Um, oh, wow. Like ball. Yeah, I was with Catwoman and Superwoman and most mostly the women. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Photo mic. One of my so yeah, SPTDL is there. <laughs> uh, Steve says Jason vong has been ousted by Osler. <laughs> <laughs> it's the takeover, Jason. You're not getting it back. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> oh, okay. No, Jason can't hear. He said it's too loud there. What is oh. that? That is an an anime thing, is it? It's just how they make anime and things, is it? Is that what that is? Um, it's a large convention. It's a probably similar idea concept to co Comic Con. You have a lot of booths and you have presentations and ex expos. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ah. Oh. <laughs> small rig China there. Yeah, small rig is in the house. How nice of that. Small rig, uh, it's good stuff. I've got that for my uh, A6500 and A6300, actually. I like their rigs. They're, um, they're good. Yeah. I thought you had that, too. Did you Did you have the small rig rig? Yeah. I, or was that Jason? I do. Yeah. Um, I use it, too. I even, I even have a small rig. Here's a little plug for small rig there. I got a little small rig here for one of my 6300s here. So oh, come yeah. In handy. yeah. I, I like it because I, I, I get to set it so I have that HDMI locking clamp on my A6300s, yeah. which I don't have. And so just being able to have the little the little cage and lock the clamp down is actually really, really helpful. Yeah, I tend to only, because I shoot Fusion, I'll put them on if I'm doing the Fusion side of things. But if I'm just doing the photography, I'll take them off. But um, if I am doing the video side of it, I'll put the small rigs on. I mean, that, they're that quick to fit anyway. It doesn't matter, you know. <clears throat> Oh, man. Uh, where are we with the... Uh, let me bring up... Again, ladies and gentlemen, we are still on pre-show, pre-show. Uh, the show will officially start at 7 o'clock. Again, we're here with David Osler. He's uh, he's replacing Jason Vong uh, for today. <laughs> he's filling yeah. in. <laughs> <laughs> Jason's gone. Jason, have fun, man. Have some fun. Um, but uh, the chat, if you guys have any uh, questions or anything you want to throw at us right now while we're still waiting on the stream to get going later, feel free to. Um, Andre Lindo, what's up, man? And Travi, Travi Trav Photography, what's going on? Hopefully I'm saying that right. 
<laughs> Dave, you know, I, I've noticed, man, you've been you've been really busy, man. You've been hammering the YouTube stuff lately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know what? You can't uh, you can't not do it. I, I'm also trying to do what I think you showed it, where you actually had talking about putting on one pick, one or one uh, video a day to see if it can uh, increase your numbers. So I gave that a go. But I'm I'm going through this sort of thing of showing how a business is, is setting yeah. up to run. And I thought I'd do that uh, as a way to get on each day. So yeah, I thought, you know, why not give it a bit of a hammer and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be I honest, followed that from when you talked about that, yeah. Just, just try different things. I mean, honestly, it's um, just try different things and see if they work. That's how it is. I, that's what I try to do. I just try something different and, and see what works, whether it works or not. Um, but. Nah, I've been noticing. I was like, man, Dave, Dave's been busy. I know Steve. Steve's been busy too. Uh, <laughs> yes, I've seen them too. I've been watching a couple of Steve's videos. They've been good, actually. Uh, I watched mm -hmm. the one where he did was showing his rig that he bought, and uh, he's been testing some lenses lately, uh, doing a few different things. So Steve's uh, hammering it as well. It's good to see. And think that nice yeah, I, English accent. Yeah, I really like his comedic uh, his comedic take sometimes with his uh, with his actual <laughs> videos. I kind of dig it. Um, so, yeah, he should keep going yep, with it. It's pretty good. I sub to him, so I'm I sub to you, mate. So uh, yeah, I've, I've got you as a as a sub. So I am checking out what you're doing, which is good. I love the video you put on showing where the skateboarder was riding through the streets. That was really really cool. So um, yeah, he's putting up some good stuff. <clears throat> He said, I did one day in June, he gained 60 subs. Hey, that's pretty good, man. Um, just getting one day, getting like a fifth, like anything plus plus that much is pretty good. Yeah, I think I'm uh, averaging about 10 per day. That is roughly for me. So it's not heaps, but it's it's still growing. <clears throat> I noticed, um, you know, it's really tough when you finally get that groove and you start seeing the growth with the channel. Um, it, it, it kind of goes in waves. Sometimes it'll go really well, and then sometimes I'll just like kind of dip in terms of like the yeah. the movement and the growth. Yeah. It just usually depends. Um, but I've tried that thing you recommended, which was so. the tagging program. So I paid for that. Uh, so I'm going to see how that goes uh, that you mentioned in that uh, video you brought up. Um, oh, so the, I'm going to go and see how it works. Yes. Yeah. The vidIQ extension. Yeah, yeah, so I'll see how that goes. So I've paid for the boost, so and it seems to be doing okay, so I'll just see how it goes over the time. Yeah, we'll see. I, Andrea's I'm still joined us. Uh, let's see. JYP Photo says, if anyone's having any connection issues, if you're on the stream, let us know. Uh, feel free to drop a little uh, comment there. I'd appreciate it just to help us out a little bit, just to make sure we're not we're not talking as completely, we're completely gone. <laughs> um, Oh, that'd be really bad. I I don't know. There was that one time when me and Jason, when we when I totally when we were first starting to use Google Hangouts and we had to use our phones to talk to each other. It was the worst. It was ah, uh, it was oh. such a bad bad live stream. And there was this. I didn't realize it was just a little tiny click I needed to make because I just got the road. I just got this right. My my uh, the Rode NT USB, and I just needed to change one little setting, and I didn't change it. I didn't know. And yeah. uh, it would have it would have fixed the whole problem. And we spent like an hour and a half on using our phones just to communicate. It was just the worst time, <laughs> man. I felt so bad. <laughs> well, JP uh, JY Photo said it's fine now. So he said he had just had to restart his iPad. So the connection's okay. Okay, awesome. Um, <laughs> thank you, guys. Mario, thank you. Um, Photo Mike. Steve, Steve says, I put secret messages in my tags, little Easter eggs, <laughs> anyway, you see that I can Ah, see. that's the secret. Oh. Max, says, when, do you, when do you know it's time to go full frame? Well, basically, Max, as soon as you can, probably. Um, I mean, I, look, but I, I do shoot APS-C and full frame, uh, at, but if I am getting something that I know is going to be put on a massive wall or something like that, I'll always tend to go full frame. Uh, before I would use my A6500. I, I don't have an issue with using the A6500, and I've got a lot of videos that will show that, and the results are still amazing. Uh, but if you really want that real depth of field in your images uh, and stuff, you know, you just can't go past a full-frame look. But well, that's just my opinion. What do you think, Danny? 
you know what's your as opinion? far as uh as far as the <clears> jump <throat> it really depends on where you're at in my opinion i think if if you're doing portraits and you know you're picking up a lot of work and you need better low light performance i think the jump to full frame is worth looking into um if you're looking in the sony camp uh i don't know i i was i think we could talk about it a little bit later or kind of talk a little bit now i guess but um, Dave, would you would you still recommend the A7 II as kind of like an initial full frame camera for people to jump to? Yes, yes, I would. Look, if if money is is probably an issue, the A7 II is a great way to learn. Uh, it, it's a still a, it's a beautiful camera. The only thing, like I said, is it can have issues if you're dealing with low light uh, focusing. But if if you have a decent fast lens, that the you can get around that and it does focus quite well. So that that can be a, a thing with the A7 IIs. I still wouldn't hesitate for anyone that's starting wants to get in the ground up to get the A7 II. It's still probably the 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 cheapest full frame you can get in mirrorless. Well, it's really the only one like that that you can get. So it's it's a great way of getting into the the Sony system if you wanted to get into full frame. So I still would recommend even to buy it now. Uh, if you can, um, and then upgrade later on. Obviously, if you start to need more, like resolution and stuff, you could start to think about getting the A7R2 or whatever's released shortly. But yeah, there's still nothing wrong with that camera at all, and it'll still be a good camera for years to come. Awesome. Um, so, as far as your hi, use, Dave. Hi, Dion. He's a local Melbourne person. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Someone I know just popped on. Yeah, what were you going to say? Um, so as far as like the A7 II, so you've, you've used them in the professional environment, shooting weddings or gigs like that, and you've, and you felt that they did a pretty good, decent job for you, Dave? Yeah, they're fantastic. I, I mean, I used them in the wedding I just did a couple of weeks ago. So they're still, uh, really, really good. There's no reason why, why you still wouldn't use them. Um, for me, for instance, I was talking about this earlier that, um, because I'm running a business that can justify selling this gear and then upgrading, I constantly upgrade my gear. If I wasn't doing that and running professional, uh, professional photography business, I wouldn't be uh, getting rid of my A7 IIs. But because, you know, because it's, um, I can claim it back on tax and stuff, I am upgrading. There's nothing wrong with those cameras at all for what they, they produce. Uh, and the results are stunning. It still has amazing uh, recovery in your shadows. The dynamic range is amazing on those cameras. Uh, the video is is also reasonably good. I must admit, I don't use it much for video. I'll tend to use the A6500. But if you're talking about just true photography, uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with those cameras at all. And that 20 megabyte, 20 megapixel uh, size is the sort of sweet spot for, um, mm. you know, for that file size. It, using the A7R2 for weddings can be a bit overkill sometimes for file size. It just ends up being, you know, just too much, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of of uh, file size for a wedding. So yeah, I think it's still an amazing camera and, and obviously the a7 III Which we'll talk about later is also going to be a you know a pretty amazing camera too, but yeah, no hesitation in using it at all All right. Thanks Dave. Let's jump to the chat real quick um, Patrick Chang says I went from the 6300 to the a7 mark II. love the image quality although he says I miss continuous eye autofocus Okay uh, Jay Wagner Which jump from Sorry, go ahead, Dave. That's okay. No, you're right. Uh, Jay Wagner says, should I get an A7R2 or an A9? Wow, Jay, that's a loaded question. But you know what? Before we got, get to that, Jay, uh, we're going to have to hold off because you know what? It's 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Monday Live starts now. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the live stream. If you're wondering why Jason Vong looks a little uh, pale today. <laughs> <laughs> Much better looking. Uh, we might have a very handsome, uh, handsome guest today. Uh, his name is David Oster, and I'm not going to introduce him. He can do the introduction himself. So, um, David, please introduce the internet to yourself and everyone that doesn't know who you are already. Yeah, well, hi, everyone. Um, well, I'm a wedding and portrait photographer from down here in sunny uh, Melbourne, Australia. Well, it's not that, well, it is sunny today, but it's cold. Um, yeah, I've been sort of a professional photographer for a number of years now, uh, building up my YouTube channel as well, uh, as well as shooting weddings and portraits. Um, I've been following Danny and stuff for a while, ages actually, and uh, it's been, I've always sort of joined into his discussions, which has been great too, and, and I was wrapped when he actually said uh, to pop on today to replace the other one that's not here. Jason, which I think is an, at an anime expo, so... Um, yeah, it's, he chose, it's been, he, it's been he chose great. that over us. He chose that over over the show. <laughs> yes, he did. He, he, he dumped us, as we say here uh, in Melbourne. Uh, yeah, I, sh I mostly shoot weddings. Ninety percent of my work is well, not ninety, probably eighty percent of my work is weddings, and the other twenty percent is doing modelling shoots. 
I specialize in those um, areas. I don't tend to ever do baby shoots now or very rarely do family shoots and stuff like that. Uh, I came from a fashion background uh, when I used to work in the fashion industry years ago doing advertising uh, with photography and um, stuff. So I've just sort of kept it going and yeah, my business is really successful. So yeah, that's sort of it from me. Um, but it's, I just want to give things back now to people. <clears throat> That's great. And guys in the chat, if you have anything you'd like to ask personally or want to learn more about Dave, just do like a hashtag. I guess we could do hashtag Dave. Is that fine? Or yeah, that's fine. <laughs> or, yep. or something like that. If you have something you're curious about, maybe his business or how he operates, and we can tackle those in a little bit here. Um, but we are just starting out. And again, thank you again for everyone joining us on the live stream this evening. Uh, we have quite a few topics that we're going to cover today, and we added a few more just a little while ago, so we're going to try to jump to them today. If you do have any types of questions, you can do the hashtag Dave or hashtag QA. We'll go ahead and jump into those later and take a look. But we are now going to jump into our segment called New Gear. It's something that uh, Jason Vong had started up a little while back. And uh, if you have any new gear that you recently grabbed, uh, we'd love to hear what they are. Just put a hashtag New Gear and just type in exactly what you recently got. So. Uh, Dave, I'm going to start off with you. Um, what did you recently uh, pick up, Dave, or are going well, to or looking for? Well, well, I actually haven't. Um, unlike, which is unusual for me, I actually haven't bought anything apart from the A9, which I bought um, just a few weeks ago. But uh, the thing that I am actually deciding to do is I'm actually selling my A7 IIs. I've got two of them that I use um, for my business. Uh, and I'm selling both of them. I've actually sold one yesterday to a, a lovely young guy that came that's uh, going to use it for travel, and I'm selling the other one possibly tonight or tomorrow. I'm not sure. But uh, the reason why I'm selling them is because in sort of waiting for the A7 III, I want to be prepared for when that actually comes out. Now, we're in the quiet period here at the moment. It's winter, so our wedding season has dropped off, just probably like the States. But uh, So I'm actually going to sell my um, two A7 IIs uh, why I can get something decent back for them and hopefully I'm waiting for the a7 III to give me what I want which you know I'm hoping it's similar to what the a9 has and then I'm just going to use that money to upgrade to uh, the new a7 III whenever it comes out if, if the a7 III sort of fails in in what I want then I'd have to make a decision on what else to get um, but at this stage that's probably all the gear that I'm talking about um, I've had millions of um, people asking about if I want to sell lenses as well, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm not selling the lenses. I always tend to keep lenses, but just get rid of the bodies. Uh, it tends to be the way that I use. So what about yourself? What are you looking at getting or get or you've got? Um, well, before I jump to that real quick, Dave, I want to ask you one question. You know how you're transitioning, yes. you're selling off your A7 IIs. Uh, while you do that, as far as you said that right now the wedding season or the, the, the working season you have is kind of slowing down just a tad bit, and then it'll pick up a little yep. later. Is that what you're mentioning? Um, what other So what other bodies are you going to jump to? You just mentioned the A9, or if you're going to shoot a wedding, or what would you jump? What, what yeah, gear do you well, have still on hand? At the moment, you've, you, so you've always got to make sure that you've got backup. So I wouldn't sell those because, I mean, I may get, for, there could be a wedding that or someone wants to shoot tomorrow. You just don't know. Sometimes you can get someone that will do a late booking. But I've still got the A9 and I've also got the A7R2 um, as well. And I've also got the A6500 and the A6300. So I've got enough cameras that can give me backups in case if, if I have an issue. The way that I'm tending to go at the moment is I think I'm going to be using the A9 mostly in my weddings because I love that file size that it gives me. So that's probably going to replace my A7 IIs. Um, and I'll still be using the A7 IIIs to do the formal shots, which means the, you know, the ones what, what I might be able to sell in big posters and stuff for the bride and groom. So I'm tending to use both of those cameras at the moment for weddings, which will be the A9 and the A7 uh, and the A7R, uh, the A7. 7R3, yeah, two, I mean. Um, so they're the ones that I'll be using. I was getting confused with cameras, and I know the numbers just drive you nuts sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I have got the large file size if I need it, and I've also got the 20 megapixel size if I need it too, and also the recovery of the A7R2 is much better than the A9. I shouldn't say much better, but it is better than what the A9 is. So if, if I do have an issue where I do need that dynamic range, I'll still be using the A7R2. Um, if the a7 III is a good release, well then I may then 
possibly pull out the a7r2 and then put that in and then just use the a7r2 for portraits and stuff like that in studio or, or things like that um, i'm hesitant to use that too much because of its file size so that that's the issue with the a7r2 um, whereas the a9 is just amazing and the low light focusing and everything is is just changed yeah. the way i think now as a wedding photographer so it's hard to go back now. Once I've used that camera, the A9, it's hard to go back to the A7Ts, and I just—that's yeah. the reason why I'm selling them now. Once you've gone A9, you just can't go back. <laughs> <laughs> it is—it is really difficult, and um, you know, I've had my say about the cameras regards to the the, the heating issues that I've dealt with. But uh, the camera is phenomenal. I mean, I, I have—that's the you know, if if for whatever reason the unit that I have works well, then I'm, I'll be a happy camper. Um, but yeah, at, that, that's great. Uh, as far as the stuff that I got, I picked up the, a really, well, a fairly inexpensive prime lens, a 35 F 1.7 from Makey. And I also picked up the Metabones, um, EF to E mount version oh, okay. five. Yeah. And How's I got working? the, uh, the Metabones is doing okay. I haven't had a chance cause the reason why I wanted, I was looking at the Metabones was because Dan Watson had done a video about using the long, the long prime lenses at 300 f2.8 to 400 f2.8 with the A9. And then all of a sudden there was an updated firmware on the Metabones and saying that now you can actually get about 10 frames per second using oh. the Metabones speed booster with continuous autofocus with the A9. And I have my Sigma 120 to 300, which unfortunately does not autofocus properly at 10 frames per second. So I was thinking, okay, let's go ahead and try, try it out. But so far, I haven't had a chance to shoot anything uh, specifically with it. So, but um, <laughs> it, once the opportunity comes around, uh, I'd like to test it out. So, uh, but yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I've tended to not go um, the adapted lenses at all. I, I do have one, which is the 105 uh, macro. It's the Nikon one, I think. Uh, but I, I haven't used that. Again, I suppose you have to manually focus. That's not an issue with the focus peaking and stuff, but mm -hmm. I don't have that. And I bought a Samyang. Uh, wide-angle lens that uh, is a video lens, so it, it's it's actually the video type with the big cogs, so that you can use the follow focus and stuff. They're the only ones that I have that are not um, native Sony lenses, mostly due to you know that I want to make sure that I can use proper eye focus and and things like that for me. So that's the reason why I haven't gone over to any of these adapted lenses. How are you finding the, the focus on most of, of these other adapted lenses? I'll tell you when I um, the A seven R two I was using a Sigma MC eleven adapter and I was I was adapting a thirty five Sigma the f one point four the Canon mount it was pretty bad in low light I was actually yeah. shooting like an event like a school dance or whatever or like a prom kind of deal and I had to basically manual focus the entire evening it, it would not mm. the adapter would not auto focus properly so I had fun doing that it was a good challenge. Um, <laughs> But the only reason why I'm 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 on the I'm on the adapter route right now with the longer lenses because uh, Sony doesn't have any longer telephoto lenses at the time yeah. being that have like that fast yeah. aperture. So until they do, and we'll talk about it a little later, it might it might change. You know, get rid of the. the I saw that um, there was a thing somewhere that I read the other day talking about the Canon long lenses were still not working very well with uh, the A9. Did you see that? I can't remember the article that talked about that. It mentioned that the, it wasn't very good at those long lengths. Um, I think it might have been- That's what I'm hearing. I, I, think, I think even Metabones mentions that in their literature as far as the, uh, the firmware update and as far as performance concerns that the longer telephoto ranges, it doesn't perform as better. But um, I mean, I'll just have to try it out unless someone in the, in the chat actually has had a chance to use that combination with the new firmware update. Um, but other than that, you know, we'll just find out. Yeah, so. let us know if you have guys in the chat. So if you have used those longer lenses in there, let us know in the chat because, uh, you know, I'm curious about it too. I mean, I'm tempted to get the 100 to 400 uh, lens when that's released because that, that may be a good sweet spot for me. Um, but, you know, I'll probably test that when it's released and, and see how that is. Are you tending to think you'll go for the, the longer type lenses, are you, when they're, they're not that 100 to 400? <laughs> Um, the 100 400 is a little slow for me. I think in terms of what I, I would do, the 70 to 200 G Master that I already have plus the 1.4X extender or even leveraging a 2X extender will probably be a better m middle ground because you'll get the same focal length range yep. and pretty yep. much similar aperture. So I, I was just going to go that route. Yep. 
All right, let's go ahead and jump to the chat for hashtag new gear. Tag the shooter. Oh my goodness, tag! I saw that video. <laughs> I, my heart. I don't know if you guys were lucky to see the video while it was still up there for tag the shooter. I, my heart broke for tag. I, I'm I'm dead serious. Um, you know, uh, his uh, his hot shoe had broken. I didn't see the, it. He had it for a little bit, but I saw it. I watched it all, and I could feel I could feel that frustration. I could feel it. I could feel it in here, and. Um, but he, his hot shoe had some issues. Like it broke. It it, it dented on his oh. A9. Oh, and, no. uh, but uh, it looks like luckily uh, b &H is doing the replacement, it seems. So tag the shooter. I'm glad everything's working out for you. And hopefully you can get, I, I, I don't know if, you, if it got to you already or you're going to get the camera soon uh, for your next gig. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it seems like he says he got a Sony A9 with a new free 128 gigabyte. His hot shoe broke. BH refunded it and bought a new one and got a free 128. Oh no! Twenty gigabyte fast oh. card. So, ah oh, man, I hate that it when things kinda, like that happen. Mm. It was it was a really good story. I really enjoyed it because he had the he had the tension arising in the videos, kind of like how he had it going. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it was it was a good video. I enjoyed it. It was it was, it was tough to watch. It was tough to watch, um, but it was it was good. But I'm glad they're working it out for you. Um, JYP photo hashtag new gear, two new bags, a mind shift photocross ten sling, and a Manfrotto Manhattan mover fifty backpack. Bag gas gear acquisition. Yeah, it certainly so, is. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a I few of no them. I can't what... even name them all. <laughs> um, uh, Mario Crespi, we'll just we'll just hammer this out real quick. He's asking what our opinion is of the Sony 90 millimeter f2.8 macro. Dave, have you had a chance to use it and what are your thoughts on that lens? Yeah, are? I have actually, I'm, I'm quite, it's very, very sharp. Probably one of the sharpest Sony lenses that are, that are actually out there. The only thing is it's quite slow for focusing. So there's an, an issue with it on, on anything other than an A9. The A9 stops the hunting that that camera, that lens uh, has. It really hunts if you put it say on an A7 II or one of the other cameras, even the A7R II. Um, but on the A9, it does solve that issue. Um, I, I haven't got that because I only use the, I use the 35, so I use the really small one that's the APS-C one that I just stick on my A6500, uh, and that's perfect for me for what I do, but you couldn't shoot bugs and things like that with that because you have to get too close to the... Um, to the subject, but but the, I know a lot of people use that macro for, for actual portraits as well because it's that good focal length for portraits, mm -hmm. and it seems to be a really really good lens. I've heard nothing but good reports about that, apart from the focusing, which which is an issue. Yeah, I good. That's basically what I hear. Unfortunately, Mario, I don't have. I've never used a Sony ninety millimeter macro. I've I've considered it in the past, but uh, it's just not around my. It's not around the kind of work that I'm doing, and I just. Right now, I'm just testing out some um, some extension tubes to get me by on some macro <laughs> stuff with with emails. So, get the 35. It's so cheap, and it's it's so it's so good that lens. It's amazing for things like wedding rings and stuff like that. And it's you know it's tiny, uh, focus is great, and it, it's like I said, I think it's only around 300. dollars It's it's an amazing lens for the price that it is. <laughs> All right, Simon PR says new gear. He got a Rhino Ultimate slider bundle. Nice. Is that the slider Ooh. that d goes automatically? Is that is that or it's just like a regular slider? I, for some reason, when I hear the the Rhino Ultimate slider, I think it's the one that like automatically moves. Um, he's got an a seventy a Schneider wow optic seventy seven millimeter MPTV Platinum IRND one point eight filter. Sounds pricey there. Yeah, uh, it does, Schneider, it? <laughs> Schneider optic sounds kind of pricey. I think there there's stuffs on the on that. Um, Hans Fai is asking what my opinion is of the Nikon D500. Yeah, I, I haven't, I've yet to put out that review out, which I've been, I've been slow on. Um, but as far as my opinion on it, in terms of if I had to go back in time, if I was just doing sports purely and I had to choose a camera just purely for sports photography, Hans, I, I would actually go with the Nikon D500 system over my Canon system. But it's just that I do video, and so that's the reason why I would, I would consider the Canon side a, more, a slightly more advantageous. But I really enjoyed shooting with the Nikon D500 while I had it. With a, I shot like four different sporting types types of events: track and field, swim, baseball, and soccer. The Nikon D500 was solid, like through and through. I I, I had no qualms about it. It just sucked because I had the Nikon D500 while I had the Sony A9. 
<laughs> so, you know, I asked for the review unit for the Nikon D500, and then I got the A9 shortly after. It was so, it was really difficult. It's like, what do I do? I want, I need to test out the, the D500. I have like, you know, so many days with it. And then I just got the A9. So it was just, a, it was such a struggle. But Hans, that's my, yeah. that's my thoughts on it. I, you know um, what, the thing, the interesting thing about that, Danny, too, is I came from uh, Nikon or Nikon, whichever way you want to pronounce it, but I had the D4S and the D810 before I sold them off to get my um, Sony gear. But for everything I hear about that D500 is it's probably one of Nikon's uh, classic cameras. That, that The focusing is meant to be amazing. The low light focusing is, is incredible. Um, it, it's a really underestimated camera. So it's going to be interesting to see where they take that. Uh, it's a pity they couldn't put that into a mirrorless system because, um, you know, it would be an awesome, uh, awesome camera. But uh, yeah, I, I hear nothing but good reports about that camera. Yeah, definitely. It's, yeah. it's, it, that's what you're doing sports wise. You're getting in there and you need the reach, the D500. I think it's a solid, solid way to go. And there's video. I just didn't get a chance to really test out the video aspects of the camera. I just didn't have the time for it. Um, but if you still have the option for 4K, I just didn't get really get to evaluate the quality of it. So, but it, it is there. Patrick Chang, you hear your Manfrotto backpack. He replaces my old Kata bag. Oh. Nice. Um, oh. Simon PR also, uh, man, he got a Manfrotto X Pro head. Is that like a roll? Nice. That just for like a photo tripod or like a ball head for a video? Um, Andre, thanks, man. Let's see. Casper's asking if there's any more overheating with the A9. Honestly, I, I've been indoors lately. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's hot. It was last week we were hitting, it was like last couple of weeks here in my area, I was getting like over like 110 at the highest, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And I was getting like suntan burn. Like I like if you look out here at my arm, I'm getting that farmer's tan. It was nice. even worse than this. <laughs> And people didn't realize, like, I was like, I was in, I was actually out there in the sun, like melting while I was doing my test. Like, <laughs> cause I typically will do that. And I'm like, I'm getting this like really harsh farmer stand here. And yeah, I mean, I was, I was out there shooting. Um, but right now I've just been indoors, kind of relaxing, doing my videos indoors lately. So I don't get <laughs> <laughs> so much. Yeah. So uh, Casper, I, I will do, I, I don't know if I, I, I honestly, I don't even want to bring up the A9 overheating as like an actual video anymore because there was just so much, so much. Uh, it was such a mess that whole situation. But if there is, a, if it is an issue, and I, I do a full review later on, I'll, I'll mention it. But it's, it's not on my radar right now. So so far, no, no overheating. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chester Bay says new gear, Sony 85G Master, and the 24 to 70 G Master. Oh, nice. Chester, I'm jealous. I don't even have I don't have either of those lenses. I've 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 been much money. one of them. <laughs> the 2470. <laughs> Dave, do you got the 2470? No, I'm not. I'm not running any G Master lenses, Danny. I, there's reasons why I haven't. I, I could clearly get them if I if I wanted to. But the, the main reason why I moved from the Nikon to the Sony was because of weight. So for me, mm -hmm. if I'm lugging gear. What, lenses around for the whole day i don't want to have that saw back anymore so I, I use mostly primes i have got the 70 to 200 but it's the f4 and i've also got the 24 70 f4 uh, i only take the um 70 70 to 200 f4 with me for the compression the rest of the time i'm using the 85 baddest and the 35 1.4 sony lenses um so yeah so i'm not using i don't think i probably will get the g master because i'm really comfortable with what i'm getting and i love the weight so what's kind of your setup kit now when you go out and shoot a wedding? What do you what would you usually put on your A7 Mark IIs, for example? Yeah, so the Ace, the way I tend to work now is I'll, I'll carry two cameras. Well, I usually carry three because I'll have one that's sort of strapped onto the top, which is the A6500 with the 24 uh, 1.8 lens, which I adore. On the other camera, I'll have the Battis. So it, usually that will now be on the A9. I'll put the Battis on that. And on my A7R2 or the A7 next to me will be the 35 1.4. So I can switch between those two lenses. I always take the 16 to 35 with me for wide shots that I need if I'm doing big group shots or something that's wide. But they're mostly kept in the bag, the same with the 70 to 200. They're kept in the bag and brought out for when I need them for later on. Uh, I tend to now like to shoot wide open with everything. So I'm always shooting at 1.4 or 1.8. 
Um, so that's the reason why I love Prime so much because I can get that beautiful uh, out of focus look, which you just can't get with the the primes uh, with the zoom. Sorry. Yeah. So for me, it's all really about prime shooting for me, and um, I've changed totally the way I used to shoot. I used to carry all the time the seventy to two hundred two point eight and the twenty four seventy two point eight. That was when I had Nikon's. Uh, but by the end of the day, I could hardly walk. Uh, my back was that sore that I thought I'm not going to do this any longer. And now I just adore using this look. And plus, it's what my clients tend to love now, that look of the, the out of focus that I get, which is shooting wide open. Um, yeah. it, you know, it's the way I just want to shoot. So I don't think I probably will get any of these um, GM lenses. I just don't feel like I need them for the type of work that I'm producing. Uh, I do dance recitals later on this year where I may need to go to a 70 to 200 2.8 but if i did have that happen i'd just rent one uh, and because the amount of time that i actually have to have it is so rare now that you know i just don't think i'm going to move over give me a 1.35 and i'll be i'll be happy <laughs> one point <laughs> uh let's see here tag the shooter was saying that pro support got him a loaner out and then uh bnh oh, says i'll get it tomorrow for my wedding on friday he's going to shoot uh, and yeah, oh, cool. tag the shooter. The the D five hundred I had was a it was a loaner unit from B and H for review. It wasn't a, a unit that I actually purchased for myself. Uh, let's see here, uh, Andre Lindo new gear. I got the Young Nuo trigger for the YN six hundred and Nether Flash. Oh, nice! Cool. Very cheap and expensive I've way to get started. Yeah, I've never used those um, off camera flashes. I use the Sony ones, so the HLV sixties are the ones that. I'm using again. I tried to sort of stick with that proprietary bit because at the time when I bought mine, there was no other option. So uh, I've just got those Sony flashes. Whereas now, you know, you can go to Godox and there's all different ones that are out there that give really good results. Tag shooter says uh, also new gear. He got the Godox AD200 and it's replacing his Flashpoint 360. He's really liking the recycle time. Yeah, they're very good apparently. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Any more new gear here? Uh, Photo Mike says just got the Sony FDR X three thousand to record videos with. Is that a, 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 like a straight up video camera, Photo Mike? I'm, I'm assuming it is, right? FDR. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, yeah. It must be. You just don't see those very much anymore. Like everyone's gone to sort of SLRs now. You know the the digital cameras that you just don't see many of the. Uh, normal video recorders uh, anymore you know I, I don't know i mean it's even crossed my mind to even look at a, a sony fs5 because of the, the overheating thing with video but um like i said after they did the sony alpha 6300 firmware update i kept my 6300s because like the 6300 i'm using now would probably have overheated at some point while we we're doing a live stream but because of that new firmware update, it, uh, it's able to get through a, a live stream just fine so i'm pretty happy Okay, he says it's an action cam. There we go. It's an action cam. Oh, okay. All right. We got to jump to the news, Dave. We got to move. Dave Sincere, yeah, man, what's up? It. What's going on in the house, Dave Sincere? <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go ahead and jump to the news. All right, so Sam Yang or slash Rokinon, I don't know how it works or – do they do they all is it is it one of those where it comes out of the same factory? They just rebadge it yes. or they it literally it's exactly separate the same. Right. Um there were their 35 millimeter f2.8 is coming out in July. It's a full autofocus lens, and it is competing directly with the Sony 35 f2.8 uh for 800 US dollars. And the one from Sam Yang is clocked in at 400 US dollars. I don't know what that will be for our Australian friends. Um, expensive. <laughs> expensive. <laughs> but um, Dave, I, it, would this be a, a potential lens? I mean, it's fairly small. Is this something you would probably maybe could even consider putting into your bag or? Oh yeah, uh, it, it, it certainly is. I have the, the Sony 35 2.8. I love that lens. It's, it's a really good travel lens. Um, so I do use that, and and to be honest, my second shooter often uses that uh, for weddings on the A7 II. So she's carrying around the the A7 II with that actual lens on it because the the 2.8 is quite a good um, aperture for for shooting indoors. Uh, it's really really good, and it is partly weather sealed. That there's a couple of things I think with the Samyang. You, you, look, it's apparently very good. It, it's a little bit soft on the edges, but also it's 
it's not weather sealed at all and it also has a little bit of noise apparently when you're focusing that could be an issue for me particularly where I'm doing fusion and video together um, so they're, they're little things that you sort of have to think about and justify that extra expense um, like I said I've got the Sony 35 but apparently the results are pretty good from that lens for what it is so if, you, if you're just starting out and you, you've got an a7 II uh, and you want to put, you know, a decent 35 mil travel lens on it. Well, you can't go wrong with that sort of money. I think it's 5.99 here uh, in Australia. The price of that um, that Samyang lens. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it's a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred dollars difference. But yeah, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, you know, I I'm interested. Um, honestly, for me, for the for what I'm doing, I I wouldn't mind having a small like pancake type size lens with a 35 f 2.8 I really like the, the 35 millimeter focal length um, but I already have I mean I already have some smaller options with uh, with my Sony uh, a6500 or a6300 I don't know if I would want to add a 35 but um, I honestly I don't have a native I don't have a native 35 millimeter lens right now I don't have the Sony yeah. Zeiss 35 you do though right Dave you have that 35 yes. yeah I've got I've got that 35 yeah See, because I've been looking to get one because I love 35 and the 85. If I'm going to shoot two full frames, I'll typically have a 35 and an 85, 35 and 85 on my uh, my body. And uh, but I really like the 35 millimeter focal length. But I think f 2.8 is not bad if you just need something really light. But if I knew I had to shoot a really low light, I'd, I'd prefer maybe something a little bit brighter, maybe an f 2. Yeah. Um, but Sony doesn't. Unfortunately, have no. They've only got the twenty-eight, like I think, haven't they? The twenty-eight f two, I think it is, is is okay. one that they've got, I think. But uh, I find that that is incredibly sharp. Sometimes I've been surprised. I thought that I took that image with the uh, thirty-five one point four, and then I realised that it was my second shooter using the thirty-five two point eight. That lens actually is really, really, really sharp. Like I'm amazed how good that lens actually works, and it's tiny. Like if you if you're dealing with something like for travel. Uh, you know, it, and 35 mil is a perfect focal length for doing street photography. So if you're walking around the street, you don't want to be seen much. Uh, you know, you sort of want to hide in the shadows and then just jump out and scare someone <laughs> half to death. It's that perfect um, focal length that you can sort of use. So, yeah, I wouldn't hesitate in getting it. But like I said, I, I've got the 35. And I'd, if I was still purchasing now, I'd probably still buy the Sony version, even though it's, it's dearer. Just for me, because if I am shooting the video, that silent bit could make a difference if you can hear it it yeah. would drive me nuts i'm a perfectionist but you know for that sort of 399 dollars you can't go wrong can you it's um you know it's great and hopefully this is a sign of things to come with sam yang yeah just giving more options for consumers uh giving that tiered of options for people to choose from i think it's a good option um because sony and you know they're they're working on building their lens lineup so but it's just good to have alternative options out there for uh for the Sony individuals out there that are shooting. Um, but yeah, Samyang 35 or the Rokinon 35. I, I know from before the 50, they have a 50 millimeter F1.4. I never got a chance yeah, to use it, but I could have sworn the reviews was that it was slow to focus. Was that the case? And it yeah. was slightly yeah, noisy. That, that's the issue. And, and like I said, I'd have to test these to see how the focusing actually is on those uh, lenses compared to, to what I've already got. Um, but like I said, I, you can't go wrong with that. I've got that mounted now on the a7 II now. It's actually mounted on that uh, camera. Like I said, I don't take it off it. It's nearly always on that camera uh, because it's just such a nice lens to actually use. And I love that 35 mil focal length. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a great lens. Man, Dave, you're going to make me want to get a, <laughs> get a Sam. <laughs> I'll show it to you. I'll just grab it because it's right in here. <laughs> Dave's gone, guys. Uh, we've lost David. David. <laughs> there you go. There it is. Lovely and small. Um, you know, it's got the lens attachment on the front, which which is really, really good. I mean, it's tiny. It's um, it's just a beautiful lens, and it feels really nice. It's got the nice sort of friction on the the focal. You know, on your zoom ring here, and not zoom ring, but to manually focus and stuff. Yeah. And it's 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 lovely. It's just a good lens. Get one. All right. Let's see what the comments, if anyone's talking about the 35 or not. Let's jump back in there. Um, let's see. And, and uh, Dave, if you see anything in the comments you'd like to point out, go for it. Um, if you see yep, anything that stands no, out to you. 
Dave, well, Dave Sincere said to me, do you have any trouble, hard time finding gear in Australia? And no, we don't. I mean, I can buy directly from B&H if I want to, uh, but I don't tend to do that anymore because the price now of the, uh, it's 30% roughly difference in the dollar. So by the time I buy it in the US and pay the difference uh, coming over the duty and stuff, it ends up being the same price. But we do get everything you guys get and never have an issue. Sometimes though, it can be a week or two longer to get stuff here but sometimes if they come from japan we can get it first so it just depends but now there's no problem in getting any gear out here at all it's just expensive that's the um the issue like i said the a9 for me was just on seven thousand dollars so uh it's it's not cheap uh courtney clark says anybody using the 50 millimeter f1.8 fe is it noisy or is it just mine uh my unit is noisy uh courtney my 50 F1.8 FE is a little bit noisy. So uh, just wanted to answer that. <laughs> yeah, I've got the 55 uh, 1.8 and I love that lens. That's that's a beautiful lens. No, that's an awesome lens. I, I, I Like I said, I have that one too. I, I was really contemplating that 24 to F1.8 Zeiss. Yeah. I, <laughs> it just would be nice if it fit the entire full frame um, spectrum. That'd be really nice. Yeah. Let's see. And, uh, oh, Dave Sincere asked, David, how long have you been shooting? Oh, boy. I'm pretty old. Um, a long, long, long time. I mean, I originally started um, as what they call an apprentice here. Uh, I don't know how long ago, even in the 70s, I think. But I, I, I worked for an advertising agency and I used to do film and stuff like that. Uh, so that's how long I've been shooting. So I did that for a long, long, long time doing um, advertising. So I came from that side of it. And that's also where I learned a lot about um, using Photoshop because I, I actually use Photoshop from version one um, for, for magazines and stuff down here in Australia. So I did all that. Then I left there and I ended, ended up teaching in university photography for around 20 odd years. So I taught that from film right the way up to when digital first came out. And then I left that and went um, back to, well, I actually taught in high school for uh, around six years because I got sick of traveling to Melbourne, the, to a university here in Melbourne. So I got sick of traveling. So I taught local at school photography and then my business just went nuts. So I had to leave that and, and sort of work full time again, which I've now been doing for around five years. Um, and like I said, I do around about 30 odd weddings per year and it's as many as I want to do. I don't want to do any more than what I've got. Um, I'm happy with the amount that I get. And I also do a lot of uh, modeling shoots as well because I still have that side of it that I love um, and the retouching and things like that because that's where I came from. So yeah, I've been shooting as long as, uh, <laughs> as, long as I can remember from back way into the film days. So a long time. Awesome. Um... So, you know, I have a question for you then. When you were deciding on the system that you recently got, were you, did you primarily jump to Nikon initially or did you, where there, was there another affinity that you had for like another brand prior to jumping to no, Nikon? I sort of, well, I, no, I've always really gone from Nikon like, like right the way through. So I, I sort of kept in that like in the old film days and then I then changed coming through to, I, I think my first digital camera was a Kodak uh, camera, which was about one megapixel or some ridiculous thing that was about $12,000. <laughs> it was ridiculous. <laughs> because, I, because I taught at university, I had access to all of these. RMIT is the university, and that was one of, that's one of the biggest in Australia. Um, so I taught there for a long, long time. And I had the, therefore, the ability to get all of this new gear that was coming out, all these high-end digital cameras, which were $40,000, which were, you know, two megapixel cameras. <laughs> so that sort of got my love for the um, digital cameras. And then I went from Nikon fully, and then I just sold $40,000 of Nikon gear and just went straight to Sony from there. I, I just saw the writing on the wall of the way the industry was going to go. I like to try and always be at the forefront of things happening. And I could see the writing on the wall when, mirrorless first came out and I thought oh, I'm, I'm gonna have to jump here I'm a bit of a geek I love the technology the Nikon the Nikon stuff was tending to bore me and you know I just was a bit frustrated with where it was going and I wanted to get into video so much and that's why I swung over to Sony and they, they're basically the same sensor anyway I mean the, the Sony and Nikon I couldn't really tell any difference between using the D810 and the D7R2 so you know I haven't lost anything but I've just gained so much in you know in moving to mirrorless Awesome. Um, someone asked, uh, Casper asked, have you ever used the vintage lens on your A7 II 
R eight seven R Mark II. Dave. Yeah, I've only got a 35 mil. I've got a 35 mil, uh, really old Nikon lens that I use um, sometimes. You know what? I thought I'd love to get into all this vintage stuff, and then I tried it, and the look is interesting, but I don't know. It's just not for me. I, I tend to just like that beautiful, sharp looking images that the new lenses will give me. And, and I'm just not really into the vintage look. If I want to do that, I could just do that straight away in Photoshop. I mean, I'm good enough in Photoshop that I could get any look, but the only one I've kept is that 35 mil. Again, I love that 35 mil size. It's an old 35 mil F 2.8 lens. I can't even remember what it is. It's manual focus though. All right, uh, Dave, since here, I've seen some of your questions draft, we'll try to jump to those a little bit later. We're gonna continue on with the news right now, but I'm definitely, uh, I do see your questions there, Dave, sincere. All right, we're gonna move on. The next thing on the list that interests me, because I shoot some, I shoot sports, is the Sony 400 millimeter FE. We won't talk about it too long, but um, Sony Opera Rumors is uh, saying that there's a possibility it will probably be an F4 lens. My gut feeling tells me it's gonna be an F4 lens, and I, I don't think they're probably gonna do an F2.8 in, uh, initially, but uh, the, it's questioned that they presume that it will be announced in the next few months. So no idea when it will actually be out. But as far as announcements, it looks like it will be the next few. But uh, Dave, have you, uh, huh? What's that, Dave? Go for it. They, they, ha they have to do it. They've got to bring out a longer lens. That They wouldn't have released the A9 without having a longer lens lineup in the works because it would just be silly to say we've got this amazing sports camera and then they've just got no lenses to – to support it. I, I agree with you. I think it'll be an F4. I think an F2.8 would be just ridiculously priced and I don't know if really many people that could probably afford it. They may do that later on down the line, but yeah, I think initially they're going to be uh, using an F4. But but from what I've seen, um, see, I don't shoot sports, Danny, but most sports photographers, do, do they shoot at 2.8? Are they often running at around that F4 length? Because you, your depth of field is going to be so shallow at, at three, four hundred millimeter anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, it just depends where you shoot. I mean, I think if you're shooting a professional environment, you can get away with an F4 lens because you have studio lights. But where I shoot with high school, um, high school fields, the lighting is not very good in the evening. So football fields. So I, I typically, well, do you guys call it football there in Australia? The American, I'm just calling it American football. Uh, we call it grit. Yeah, we call it gridiron. Gridiron. Okay. Well, uh, so the American football here, it's just like, I mean, I'll go to different high school gym, uh, high school football fields, and the lighting is always different every single time. The gym lighting is different every single time, and it's not really good. I can barely get a 500 shutter speed. Sometimes I'll find myself at ISO 12,800 at shutter speed of 1,500 at f2.8. If I have to go to yeah. F4, you know, I've I'm already at 20. I'm definitely going to crank up my ISO already. So uh, for me, F2.8 is great, but I think these cameras like the A9 are performing a lot better with low light, which is really great. That I think even F4 would be would be manageable. Um, but you're right though on the on the depth of field, you're still gonna you're you're still gonna get some really amazing shots with an f4 lens i just don't know about the lighting but i think like i said the iso performance is improving with the cameras and i think it'll compensate for that but you i think you got on the ball dave it's, they really need to they need to have those lenses already in the works because they they are producing a sony a9 a sports oriented camera so they should have some of these long telephoto lenses already in the works they just need to get them get them out yeah, it's going to happen. I mean, clearly they they you know they it's going to happen. I mean, I'm hoping also they have a 135. I'd love to get say so that lens would really interest me a 135, you know, if if they could say bring that down to a 1.8 or an f2, that would be just a stunning lens for me because again, that's just a beautiful photo length that I would use. So, I'm sure that and this is what really annoys me and it does my head in sometimes when people say that Sony haven't got a good lens lineup. They've, they've got everything that the average photographer would need. And these are just the people that are, are what we call the whingers that will whinge about anything. They used to whinge about uh, Sony not having dual card slots. Well, now that's gone. So now they're still whinging about the lens lineup. That, that clearly, I have every lens that I need to work as a, as a wedding photographer and also as a portrait photographer. There's nothing that I need more than what Sony are already giving me. Um, unless someone wants to go out and buy, you know, the twenty thousand lenses that that can fit for every single scenario that you <laughs> you're after, um, yeah. that they clearly have enough. Apart from sports, sports is the only issue now that they haven't got lenses um, done, and I think you'll find that will be addressed 
possibly by the end of this year or definitely by the middle of next year. Yeah, that's that's just basically a waiting game on the Sony side. And I just want to be ready when that transition happens. That's why I still have my Canon gear up until now. But once that transition happens and they get that, that glass in, um, the change will happen. I know Tag the Shooter's asking how much I think the 400 millimeter lens will be, whether it's an F4 or F2.8. Um, if it's an F2.8, it's it's going to be at least ten thousand US dollars, if not more, yeah. twelve thousand. Yeah. I mean the I Canon version. Like <laughs> yeah, I would say twelve. And in an F4 model, I think what is it? The DO, the the, the, the Canon has a DO optics version of it, four hundred F4, and that's like right, what five, four thousand or so, four or five. I could be wrong. I don't yeah. know. So. Uh, four or five thousand U.S. dollars. That's what I'm thinking. I, I'm hoping they can keep the price reasonable because they want to get a lot of people in the system. So if they can build an F4 400 at a reasonable price, that's fair uh, for what we're doing. I think that'll be great. But uh, it's. I think it's going to be. It's definitely going to cost some money. I don't think it's going to be a. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, do I'm, I'm hoping. Do you think the Canon would be equivalent? Like your Canon and Nikon lenses, usually when they're first released, are, are, are sort of similar prices to what the Sony are released at, aren't they? It's not like they they're are. ridiculously over that price. Yeah, it's just that. So it's just I think everyone everyone sees it. They need to. I think people just seem to see it that way that they are just releasing their first gen lenses. There's not a lot of third party options right now, so prices do initially start high. But it's the same thing with Canon and Nikon. I've seen it. I mean. Um, even Nikon prices are pretty high too when they first release a new lens. It's it, like their new seventy to two hundred. Um, yeah, it's a four. Sorry, Nikon. Nikon had released a new seventy to two hundred f two point eight. It was it was fairly expensive price wise, um, similar to the Sony. So, um, but yeah, the initial stuff's gonna definitely cost money. And it'll take you know it'll take some time until prices drop a little bit and more options are available for everybody. So. The other thing they have to consider too is that those Sony lenses, particularly the GM ones, which I haven't got, but but the Gold Master lenses are future proofed in the fact that they they're sort of working out that they'll work with 100 megapixel sensors. So this is another thing that you have to consider too that w when you're buying into these dearer Sony lenses, you are actually future proofing yourself as well for upcoming sensors where. A lot of the older lenses that are out there aren't going to have the resolution to actually resolve these new lenses, uh, these new um, uh, image sensors that come out. So you know you're paying for what you get, and you're also paying for that, like I said, that hundred megapixel sensor size later on that may come out. We don't know what the A7R three is going to be, or the A9R is going to give us in in resolution. Well, at least if you have those lenses, you're going to have a lens that will resolve that sort of you know power that could come in the future. No, that's that's a good point, point. Um, and it's always a uh, it's always a revolving door. We don't know what Sony's going to do, but uh, we're hoping it's going to be a little bit exciting as we we get to our get to our news there a little bit. Um, someone uh, JYP Photo chimed in. He said the four hundred DO f four from Canon is sixty eight ninety nine, basically seven thousand U S dollars for that. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just okay. say this. <laughs> this 400 f4 is not going to be a, a walk in the park, um, unfortunately. So I think I'm going to stick with my MetaBones adapter for a little bit, <laughs> a little bit longer. I don't need 20 frames per second. I'm just fine with 10. Not a big deal. <laughs> not a big deal. Oh, uh, let's see. The 600 f4 was 17 grand. Oof. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, I don't. I don't shoot any of that nature wildlife yet. Um, no, uh, I've thought about it. I've thought about it. Maybe later on. Not right now. Uh, the only time I ever shoot, Dave. Have you ever shot wildlife like birds? No. You know what? Since I've got the A nine, I'm so tempted to give it a go, Danny. Because I um, I've now got a camera that can you know keep up with that sort of thing. So I may give it a go. I mean, I've got the seventy to two hundred f four, but the problem is you can't use that the uh, the adapter with that lens. You have to get the the gold master lens to. Mm -hmm. to put that 1.5 times adapter on it. But I should give it a go because I'd love to try it. <laughs> the only time I ever shoot birds is when I'm outside and I see a bird flying. Uh, <laughs> I'm shooting <laughs> I'm shooting a sport. I see a bird fly. I fire away and just test out the autofocusing on the camera. That's about as much yeah. as the wildlife photography I get in. But um, 
But yeah, I, <laughs> it'd be fun to try it once or twice or something to go into go in there and wear some camo gear and go in somewhere and just sit there for a yeah. while. But not something I do on a day to day basis, but something to try out once. All right. Okay, so um, chat's having a good time there. Dave, we're going to jump on to the next topic here. And yep. uh, this was posted from Sony Opera Rumors. And again, it's it's not confirmed. I would say a, t a technician from Sigma, when someone was asking them this question, uh, if they were going to produce a 24 to 70 uh, A mount lens. I think there was another lens as well. And Sigma's response to tech uh, response was that they were not there was no plans to produce an A-mount version of those lenses. Now, I have not used A-mount. It's, it's, uh, I was always interested in it with the A77 Mark II when that was coming around. I was very excited about that, and even the original A99. Um, but I've never used the A-mount. And so, Dave, have you have you had a chance to use the A-mount? And, and with this Sigma stuff going on, what do you think is happening to, happening to A-mount right now, you think? Yeah, it's, well, it's interesting. I, I haven't, I haven't used the A mount either. I've had to sort of say, well, I made a decision to just go straight to, um, you know, the E mount. Um, I, I suppose that the, the A ninety nine two. Apparently, everyone that that uses that camera loves it. They actually say it's, it's an amazing camera. So clearly, it is a good system. But Sig, Sig, I suppose Sigma have to sort of think which way are they going to go? Are they going to say start to support the E mount? It all joins. It all comes down to the dollar how many lenses that they think they can sell because there's always those manufacturing costs and startup costs for these this gear. And I just don't think even as good as the A mount is that there's enough cameras out there to support the research and development of these lenses. That That's the, that's the issue now that um, they're facing. To be honest, I was a little bit surprised when they updated the A99 too because I thought that was it. But so whether Sony is still going to support that in the long run, it must be hard for Sony to sort of make a decision between the two of them that, you know, they're pushing so much to the E side, but they still have to try and support the A. I'm not certain yet where it goes, but I think the way it's going to go in the future is it's definitely going to move everything over to the E mount. It's just a matter of time, but, you know, some of the people that are, you know, may want to comment about this and they may disagree, but that's where I think it's going to go. I think E mount is the future and A is sort of living on borrowed time almost, I think, but, you know, it might be harsh, but that's what I personally think is, is going to happen, even as a good system as it is, the A mount. Uh, I, I, you know, I just don't think they're producing enough for it. Yeah, I mean it's it's fairly quiet on the A mount end. You don't hear a lot as far as lens or even camera bodies that Sony's producing right now. It, it seems as though the resources are being pushed towards the E mount system. Um, and in, and like you're mentioning, I think Sigma is definitely seeing the sales numbers and where people are interested in and what what people are buying. And it looks like E mount is definitely having a growing interest in the reason why. Um, but I, I mean Sigma ha hasn't even. Other than a couple of lenses, Sigma hasn't really produced any native E-mount glass. There's the 30 f1.4 and a, a few other ones that they have. But I'm wondering if Sigma is, is going to start dropping um, their current lens lineup, whether or not they're going to release an E-mount version of it. So, Dave, is there any any types of uh, maybe be interested in, in an, an E-mount system? From Sigma. Oh yeah, I used to love. I used to love. I had the Sigma 35 1.4 lens uh, when I had the Nikon uh, cameras, and that that was an amazing lens. The Sigma art lenses are fantastic. Um, so if they brought out some decent lenses, I I would definitely buy them um, because I've I've tended to find that they're as good as as any other lens that you can get. Uh, I just really wish they really supported the E mount. I think it's going to come, but the, I think I just heard they were having issues or something with the flange distance or something like that was causing problems, but. You know, I'd love them to bring out a 135. Like I said, I'm hoping Sony brings one out. But if a, if Sigma brought one out for a lower cost, I, I certainly wouldn't hesitate to move over to Sigma. As long as it had all of the features that the Sony system has, like the eye autofocus and the fast focusing, to me, is so important. Um, so, you know, that that's the important thing for me. If they can't give me that eye focus and fast focusing, I, I wouldn't move over no matter how much cheaper it was. Because for me, being a professional, I have to have things that work very fast and quickly without no fuss. And, you know, if that's why I've, I've only gone into Sony lenses because I know it's just going to work. Um, so I, I, there would have to be a good reason that I'd, I'd buy a Sigma. I'd have to review it, I suppose. But the Sigma I had was amazing. 
All right, jumping into the comments, Keith Alexander Bailey looks like he he has an A99 Mark II. Uh, looks like he does enjoy using it. Uh, uses the 12 FPS. Um, he loves it. I think he gets the vibe that they might be killing off the A mount soon, unfortunately. And he is saying A7 A77 Mark III coming soon. Keith, is that uh, <laughs> on the rumor bill or uh, just something you're hoping for? Uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. It's hard yeah, to it's... know which way they'll go. It's all money. I mean, basically, at the end of the day, it comes down to dollars. And even though it's a brilliant system, and I and I've only heard that the A mount is a brilliant system, I just don't think it has the numbers to. I mean, to go like like even Nikon is struggling financially, you know. So it's it must be hard for a company uh, like the A mount system to to make money as well when everyone's going to the E mount. It's um yeah, it must be tough. All right, Dave, we're going to jump to the next news topic here. So there was a, uh, a little post that Op Rumors posted and was kind of going around. It was an image of a small, compact, full-frame, interchangeable Sony, and they labeled it an A5 <laughs> uh, as a teaser, although it was it's fake. It's not an actual camera that's happening. But uh, I thought it was interesting enough to throw it into our news bag here because... I just wanted to know, well, basically, first of all, it's, uh, for those of you that might not have seen it, it's basically a camera that they're posing. It's it's going to be similar to like an RX1R series camera. It has a, the one that has already uh, a built-in lens to it, but one that you can actually remove and replace. So something of that size, um, but interchangeable, right? Something interchangeable. Um, Dave, would you, would you have any interest at all in something like this? Um, yeah, I'm not or, sure. Who, 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 who for me, for? I'm really happy. Well, I'm really happy with the A6500 at that size. So I don't know if you need to go. Like the things that would interest me, if if it does go that small, is how are they going to use image stabilization for start? And remember, the body <laughs> size is going to then be an issue with overheating. So that 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 could also yep. be an issue as well. Um, I'm not sure that they would want to go much smaller with a full frame camera. Like they struggle now, barely getting by now. I don't have overheating, but they barely get by with the camera body sizes that they are now. So if you're going to make one that's that's that small, I'd probably just to, to get the, the you know, the point and shoots that are available now. It's um, what's Is it the Mark IV that has a full frame sensor in it? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Which one? What do you mean? The Mark IV? Or... The, the, the Sony... I think one of them, the smaller cameras, has a full frame sensor in it. In it doesn't yeah, it? the RX one. The lens. RX the yes. RX one R has a thirty five millimeter f two built in, yep. and their second generation has a has the same similar sensor to the A seven R two. So you have a forty two megapixel sensor on a small, compact size body, but it's non interchangeable lens, obviously. But it's uh, it's already built yep. on there. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think it will happen. I mean, how much can they produce? I mean, I think they they'd probably be working flat out to produce the A seven three and the A nine R, whichever it is that, you know, and possibly another A six five thousand, whatever that will be. <laughs> I can't see them throwing another one in. It'd just be like crazy because it would take away sales from other cameras that they're also trying to promote too. And I just don't think it would make any sense at this stage. Um, I think if that happened, what would happen to the A6500? Would that then just disappear and everyone would then jump onto that as their lower end camera? I mean, but you never know, but I don't think so. Yeah, I don't see it happening anytime soon because I mean, I would imagine, look, I mean, think about it. The A7 series was already compact already for most people, for interchangeable. And mm. I don't know if they can support a, a body like that, but. It's all speculation. It, it'd be interesting to see, but even the RX One R, for example, I'm. I mean, it's interesting camera. I just don't have any interest or desire to get something like that because there's already the A7 series um, full frame options available with interchangeable yeah. options. So, yeah, it's hard. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind one to play with just for travel. But like I said, I just take my A6500 when I travel with a small lens on it, and, it, and it's that small anyway. That you know, you're not saving that much by going any smaller and plus if you try to make a, a too small a body and then you, you also have a large lens on it it's not going to be comfortable in the hand anyway so all right yeah on the chat uh jy uh, jyp photo says um he would buy an a5 if it was about 1500 uh, us dollars <laughs> and uh he says he's had the rx1r before and the battery lasted him 150 shots 
Oh no, that's terrible. Yeah, that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> There's always That'd a problem. See, the more you make you go smaller with things uh, and technology changes, there's always a trade-off that you have to deal with. That's um, you know, I think you, I think the A9 is now the sweet spot of what that size will be with the new battery because th that battery is actually quite amazing for the size that it is. I think that's the sweet spot, and I think that's what's probably going to be carried over, hopefully, to the A7 III. Um, yeah. If they can do that, and then I can do a wedding with two batteries instead of carrying four or five. Um, it, it, it's a big difference. So, you know, the, and again, they've done that by making the camera a fraction larger. So if you're going to go smaller, the battery year would suck, basically. Yeah. All right, moving on to the next topic here. Um, most of you have already heard this already. It kind of came as a shock, I guess, to some. But uh, Lexar is closing down their memory development or their business in general. I mean, the, the whole company, I think, was owned by Micron, I believe, or some sort. They're not closing. It just looks like they're putting their resources into a different department, which I think deals with server-based memory, I believe. Uh, so they're seeing a huge, mm. a bigger market in that area, and so they're going to put their focus there. But it looks like they're closing down the development for um, uh, SD cards, memory cards, all that stuff that we use as photographers and videographers. Um, Dave, do you do you use any Lexar cards? And uh, your thoughts on this in general? Yeah, no, I haven't. That's probably I'm probably the reason why I'm going broke. Damn it, Dave! Um, You're yeah, the I've reason never, why. <laughs> <laughs> I've never used like I've only ever used SanDisk. I've had SanDisk the whole of my the time that I've been using digital, as long as I can remember. I've used SanDisk for everything, and the only one I've gone outside of that is to the new Sony one for the A9 because it's a quicker card. So I've bought that one is the only one that I haven't got that's SanDisk. And I've never, ever had one card that has corrupted on me in all these years of shooting, so I've just stuck with SanDisk. Um, the, the issue that affects me more is that they make some great readers, you know, like they have that those nice caddies and stuff that, that probably are no longer going to be available. Um, they're Firewire that plugs straight into your, into your Mac. So um, I will really miss the reader side of it is, is going to be an issue. But I, I suppose the winner out of this is Sony because the QXD cards now are only going to be made by Sony. So whether those prices now are going to be pushed up, um, you know, and even that's an interesting area because they didn't put the QXDs in the A9. So where is Sony even going with that yeah. that market? I think is, is Canon, is uh, Nikon the only manufacturer that uses them or do Canon use some of the QXD cards? I'm not sure, but they'd be a little bit worried, I would think. Yeah, I, I mean, it kind of stinks. I mean, I picked, I purchased an XQD card from Lexar for the Nikon D500 I was evaluating, and I so I kept that card. I sent back the camera, obviously, because it was an evaluation unit. They don't provide memory cards when you evaluate. And then, um, and then I picked up the the UHS2 Lexar card for the Sony A9, and I was going to get the original Sony branded one, but those were out of stock at the time when I was buying them. So. I typically just get SanDisk. I usually, like I have SanDisk CF cards. I have SanDisk uh, Extreme Pro cards for my Sony cameras in general. So I usually just go with Sony, I mean SanDisk. Um, I haven't had too many issues with them at all. And I, I just worry about pricing. I just worry about competition mm. in terms of future pricing and how that's going to affect the market. Uh, Lexar was kind of up there with SanDisk in my opinion. And it kind of kept the prices reasonable from both companies. So now I'm just wondering if now Sandus can just push that price a little bit higher now uh, than it did before. Yeah, that's that's the problem. You know, it's like anything. It's why I would never want to see Canon or Nikon fail because you need that competition in the marketplace. Uh, it, it's a good thing for everyone. And if you if you haven't got it and you get a monopoly on something, it, it can be really bad. And I'm just hoping that doesn't happen now with with these QXD cards. I used to use those when I had my D4S. So uh, they had the QXD cards, incredible, incredibly fast cards and very robust uh, in how they are. You can't break them or bend them uh, like you can with the SDs. But you know, I'm just wondering which way they will go now. You know, are Sony gonna start saying, well, we've got this market now, we can charge anything we like on it. Um, so I'd be a little bit worried if I was uh, using these, you know, these cards. And if you've got, if you're shooting Canon and, and you're, shooting the latest formats that take up gigabytes and gigabytes of video and you need multiple of these cards, it can be a real strain on your business if, you, if you're running heaps and heaps of them if the cost goes up drastically. Um, yeah. So, and, and is there money involved in it? Like are actually um, 
are Sony making even money on these QXD cards that, you know, if they've dropped it, well, then how much money is in, in the market? You know, could Sony just turn around and say, well, we're not going to support it now as well? So, you know, it's, it's interesting. I know Sony, I don't know how many of you are buying the Sony cards. I've been happy with that Sony one, but I haven't used it long term yet. So I don't know how reliable they are compared to the uh, the Sam, uh, the um, other SanDisk cards. So it's, it's going to be interesting over a long period of, of time. Um, but at least Sony produced these other cards, so there is a market there for multiple ones, but yeah. Yeah, at least that's there still. It's just a shame that Lexar, I don't know, the talks are that maybe someone else might come in and get Lexar, but um, who knows? Who knows? Uh, but yeah. Don't want to see companies closing. It's never a good thing. Just never a good thing with competition. Uh, let's see what the folks are saying. Uh, Canon uses the CFast cards. Those are really pricey. The CFast cards, they, uh, they, they are quite expensive. Um, and then XQD, it's only, it was Lexar. Skasandis doesn't do XQD. It was just pretty much Lexar. No, it's only, right? yeah. It's just Lexar and Sony. And Sony. Are the only two manufacturers. Sony licensed it to Lexar. So Sony, they would have been paying Sony money to actually uh, license that. So Sony would have been getting money off Lexar anyway um, to, to, for them to use it because it's, it's owned by Sony. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump to our next topic here. This was something that uh, Dave uh, wanted to go ahead and chime in on. If you are aware of what's going on lately with the Sony A9, Jared Polin, a.k.a. Frono's Photo, uh, shot a soccer match and... Uh, he did notice some banding in his Sony A9, and uh, he said in his in his personal statement. I mean, his statement is basically said his unit that he has. Uh, Dave, what are your thoughts on that situation with the banding on the Sony A9? I never personally had an experience with it, but it seems like maybe lighting conditions can affect it or shutter speed and so forth. But Dave, go ahead and take the floor. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that because I've been talking to. We have a. Um, uh, football here it's Australian local football it's just called Aussie rules but it's incredibly fast and I've been talking to a photographer that um, actually does the photography for that and um, he's posted one on my uh, I just did a talk not long ago about that but he posted one of the images that he captured uh, at that um, night match that he actually did and he put down his his actual um, settings that he'd actually used and he said that he very rarely will go over 1500 of a second um, at all to, to ever get what he needs to stop the game. Now, that's an incredibly fast game. It's much faster. Australian rules is much faster than soccer um, is. So uh, it's similar to rugby, if you know what rugby is like, but it's um, it's incredibly fast. And his image, he, he nailed it. I went to a Sony talk here a couple of weeks ago, and, and there was another photographer there that also captured AFL football, and he was saying the same thing, that he had no issues shooting at night uh, with these shutter speeds. And he was saying that he always tends to shoot about one five hundredth of a second. Um, and he'd never seen banding come up. And this other photographer had also said he'd never seen banding come up. I mean, I wanted to ask your opinion about this, but who would, I don't see there's any reason why you would want to use one four thousandth of a second uh, at a soccer match. Um, because it, it's way over what you would be using at a normal game of that type. The only Thing I could sort of think about that was perhaps tennis if you wanted to stop a, a, a tennis ball or perhaps if you wanted to stop a golf ball but clearly if you're dealing with the lighting he was using I think he's looked for it and I don't want to cause too much um, you know bad sort of thing here <laughs> but I think he was deliberately pushing that shutter to get that banding effect um, because if he he said in that in his video that when he was shooting at one thousandth of a second or one sixteen hundred there was no banding at all so yeah. I don't see why it was necessary to shoot one four thousandth. It's just something that you wouldn't do in a football game. Mm -hmm. The only time I find myself ever shooting that high is baseball. Well, I don't even see myself shooting at one four thousandths typically, but if I really want to freeze the actual object, like the ball or whatever, um, you definitely need a really fast shutter speed in order to do that, like if the ball's going or they're swinging a bat. Um, but typically, like... Like I said, I shoot nighttime sports. I'm not going to get one four thousandths of a second, no. period. So I'm and shooting at one. Too, he he yeah. only had an issue, too, because they were close to that. Uh, if you looked at the images that he was actually showing, the, the only time it seemed to happen was when those footballers were very close to 
uh, the edges, which is, had those LCD screens that were beaming actually onto him. So that's where the issue came. So for instance, if you were shooting baseball, they wouldn't have that light that's close enough to give that effect uh, yeah. because they're a fair way away from that lighting. I think he was just pushing deliberately to get that effect and he would have seen it on the screen and he said something like only 20 out of so many images had it. But And he mentioned banding 20,000 times in that video and he mentioned the other day, yes, it is clickbait. And he said that in his, in his talk the other day that, yeah, you mentioned it's clickbait and that's why I get views. But again, it's sometimes it's the Sony bashing that tends to annoy me. And I said, you can make any camera fail if you want to. Uh, because you can shoot it a certain way or whatever to get it to fail. It's just not what a good reviewer should be doing. You should be talking about real life scenario. And like I said, you wouldn't be shooting one four thousandth of a second uh, in in a soccer game. Mm -hmm. Let's see what the folks got to say. Um, uh, Keith says something about turning off the e electronic curtain, if that would make a difference. Uh, Let's see here. Chris Barr's mentioning LEDs and shutter speed. Dave Sincere says, I never, I've never gotten up to that shutter speed before. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like I said, I don't know anyone that shoots those sports will ever be shooting at that speed. Not football or soccer or gridiron, your Australian football or whatever. You're not going to be shooting. Yeah. There's no reason to shoot at one four thousandth of a second. You're not trying to stop a jet, and I said that last time. It's, it's um, <laughs> you, know, you, you shoot within the range of uh, of what a normal thing would be. And like I said, sixteenth hundredth of a second is easily enough to shoot a soccer yeah. match. Um, he was pushing it to the ridiculous extreme to get the result that he wanted because obviously he was looking for it, and he found it. But the average 99.9% .9 of shooters out there aren't going to have that issue. And that's why I'm saying banding is not an issue um, in, the, in that context. And I, I just want people to understand that, that, you know, some people do click for these baits and, and just don't fall for it. Awesome. Thanks for that insight, Dave. Really appreciate it. All right. We are going to get to our last topic of this evening. And uh, it's been causing a lot of discussion lately. I'm sure everyone's tired of it. So hopefully we don't spend too much time on it. But it has to do with the fact that the upcoming Canon C60 Mark II, with the official specs already, obviously, is not in K in the camera. And I think there's this camp of individuals, or the way I see it is that there's this, there's this group of individuals who, who want the 4K but are not getting it, that are frustrated by it. They want to future-proof their camera, uh, and they want 4K on it. But I don't know. Um, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on it, Dave. If uh, if you're maybe just maybe depends on the industry you're shooting. Maybe you're just doing wedding photography or something. Would you actually want to have that 4K or if you would need it, um, Dave? What are your thoughts on the 6D, the camera in general, and then also not yeah. having 4K? Oh, yeah. You know what? I, I think this is a fail. This is a real fail by Canon. I I, I can't believe that, that they've done this. It's um crazy the the specs that they've put in this i mean for starters they put a uhs1 card in this camera which is ridiculous so if they did want to say upgrade later on if you were using something like magic lantern or something later on i don't know how they're going to organize that to work with a uhs1 type card it's the shutter speed is is locked in at one four thousandth of a second now i was just talking about yeah. you use soccer at one four thousandth but where you do use uh, a high shutter speed is if you're doing high speed sync for instance, if I'm trying to overpower the sun, um, I need sometimes to be using one eight thousandth of a second to overpower the sun and then fire in a flash to, to give that. So this has got the same shutter speed as the A6500, which is just an APS-C camera. One four thousandth is, is terrible for a full frame camera. The flash sync speed on this is only one eightieth of a second, which is, is ridiculous as well. What? Um, yeah, it's only it's one eightieth. The bit depth in video is terrible because they're saying it does one it does one, uh, 1080p 24 but it only uses 30 megabits um, per second so it, it's incredibly low in their bit depth yeah uh, it does 1080p 60 and then it, you'll get 60 megabits per second i mean the sony's you can shoot at 100 megapixels uh, the Panasonics are talking about, I think it was 400 or some ridiculous. Yeah, 400. Remember, the more the more you get, the more ability you have later on to grade and do different things. Uh, there's no 4K. There's only 4K for time lapse. 
Canon are just <laughs> shooting themselves in the foot, honestly. And remember, I'm not paid by anyone to say any of these things. I'm not really linked to, I'm not linked to, I use Sony, but I'm not linked to Sony. I'm not linked to Nikon. I'm not linked to Canon. But clearly, if I was a Canon shooter, this would be the point to me where I say, I'm out. I'm going to sell all my gear and I'm going to go to to Sony or or Sonic yeah. or something. But, but to have this as released where the, the the file formats are worse than the 6D is what are they thinking? I mean, seriously, what on earth are they thinking with this camera? And then you'll get the photographers out there that'll say, that, unfortunately, you get these fanboys that will say everything is rosy about it and I'm only going to shoot photos with this. It, it's got a sync speed of 180th of a second, for God's sake. It, it's it's just terrible. And a shutter speed of 1 4,000th of a second. Even though this is their, en their entry full-frame camera, Oh, this is so disappointing for Canon shooters. And like I said, I want Canon to succeed and I want Nikon to succeed because I need that for Sony to develop what they develop. And th this has just a big fail for me. I mean, honestly, 2017 and you haven't got 4K on it. I know people say that you haven't got, it, not everyone is shooting 4K. I shoot everything 4K because I want that ability to crop in later on. Even though I'm only doing 1080p videos, I can crop in and then enlarge and do. It's great for stabilization because you've got enough room to move. It's 2017, put 4K in it. They just don't want to basically take away from their 5D Mark IV, but I don't know, what do you think, Danny? Do you think they're shooting themselves in the foot? I think they, they, where they hurt themselves is the, uh, is the longevity of that camera and it lasting longer. Because like you, the point being, it is 2017, and most cameras at this caliber already have 4K already in them. And whether people want it or not, it, it, it's a case by case basis the way I look at it. But for me personally, because I, I was hybrid shooting with Canon, that was the whole reason why I left Can. I kind of drifted away from Canon and started looking at Sony and Panasonic, was because I wanted to shoot in 4K. I wasn't happy with the 1080p that was coming out of the Canon cameras, and I. And I got a taste of the Panasonic. I had a friend uh, who let me try out his Panasonic GH4. I saw the quality of the video in 4K, and I was blown away by the amount yeah. of detail that it had. And I was like, I really want to get get into the, this 4K uh, system. And so I picked up the Panasonic G7s as kind of a stopgap, picked up the GH4, got rid of those, and then finally jumped ship to the Alpha 6300, which had 4K. And so I've just pretty much been shooting 4K for the most part since then because, well, for me personally, like I said, I, I, I can't speak for everybody out there, but I'm just saying on my behalf, like, I really enjoy having access to the 4K. And if I was still a Canon shooter and I had the original 6D, I would, I'd be right now, like, I would be in the same mindset. I'd be saying, okay, Sony's right here right now. Sony's releasing some really good stuff. Do I jump ship to Sony? And then now all of a sudden you see the 6D, which spec-wise it looks it has something, some some interesting features in there, but then all of a sudden we don't know what the A7 Mark III is going to have. More likely, it's going to have 4K. It kind of makes the decision really difficult. It well, actually, makes a lot of it makes it tough for the, the Canon people because so Canon is just not really trying to innovate on that end. And I don't know what it is. What they're they, it's like they just don't want to compete with their cinema line, like we've said before, or even their 5D Mark IV yeah. series, and they just don't want to. <laughs> I don't know. You know, the funny thing, Dave, I'll tell you this. I was saying the same stuff last time with the 6D. It still sold it still sold pretty well though. So I don't know what's gonna happen in 2017. Yeah. This could be the collapse of their 6D series. But I was harping on like the nine, the eleven autofocus points that this, the original 6D had. I said, Are you get are you kidding mm -hmm. me? Like when that first generation came out? But it's still sold. So I don't know. I really don't know. That's just my the way I look at it right now. I still think some people are going to buy it, but it's, it, it was a big turnoff for a lot of people that really want the 4K. I mean, the other thing too is, look, it's, it has some good features. The dual pixel obviously is an amazing focusing system. So the dual pixel side of it is probably better than anything Sony has at this stage, if you're talk, uh, talking about that. The flip out screen, why don't Sony bring that full flip out screen that they've produced? So it could yeah. be a great blogging camera, but, but then they destroy it by putting in such bad video features. I just don't understand why they'll give you half and then they'll take uh, the rest of it away. They've taken off out all the picture profiles uh, that are in there. There's no log. I mean, it's, you know, honestly, that these people just shoot themselves in the foot. I was annoyed enough about the <laughs> A9 not having um, the, the picture profiles in and hopefully yeah. they'll bring that back. But, yeah, there's just so much that this camera could have been a game changer for them. 
and you've got to look more than just how much you'll take away from other cameras. If they brought everyone into this intro camera and it was really good, people will still update. And I think it's very short-sighted to, to take so much out. And, you know, and new photographers that are, that are going to start coming in are going to start waking up to this and they're going to think, well, I'm not going to buy that because I'll look at features as against that and what the Sony can offer. And they're going to say, well, the Sony is much better for the price. And, you know, I, I think it probably will sell, but it probably won't sell anywhere near what it could have if they'd... Um, they're just not looking after their their people. And, that, and that's a really bad thing that these these companies need to do. You know, look after your people. Be like Fuji and look after your... Your, your clientele instead of just trying to make more money off people. And then they would be successful. All right. Hey, folks, we are um, pretty much at the end of the news topics. And we are now jumping into the Q&A. If you have any last uh, Q&A for myself or Dave that you want to throw out there. So uh, if you are interested in us answering any questions, go ahead and drop a hashtag QA down in the comment section below. And right now we're going to go in and jump into the current discussion that's going on in the chat with regards to Canon and uh, see what's what's going on here. So let's see. Oh, yeah, that was also another point was that they didn't include a headphone, a headphone uh, jack into the actual Canon camera, whereas the yeah, ADD actually right. has ADD actually monitor. You can actually monitor your audio on an ADD, but you can on the 6D Mark II, which is a little strange. I was, gonna, I was just... I was going to answer another question too, because one person just mentioned about the the guest saying, "I don't understand why people use one four thousand of a second. I think he misunderstood what I'm actually saying. Uh, he was saying it seems like he only uses the iPhone for sport. Well, I wasn't actually saying a daytime typically you would often have to use over one four thousand of a second. So that's important if you're dealing with daytime, but Phronos was shooting that in the evening with lights yeah. on, and that's why I'm saying, you don't need to go to one four thousandth at the evening. Clearly, if you were doing it at daytime, well, the A9 will go to one thirty-two thousandth of a second. So uh, it, it's not an issue of using one four thousandths. Daytime, yes, but nighttime, no. You wouldn't need to when it's lit up by lights. I think that person just un misunderstood what I was saying. Okay. Um, let's see here. Someone asked, uh, where's Jason Vong? He's at an anime. <laughs> He's at an anime <laughs> right now i think he's had a concert of uh probably filming uh or something like that so that's he's gone this week for the show um they're like where's jason jason's a lot <laughs> jason got a lot more handsome this time. <laughs> <laughs> let's see Someone just said it's a silly file format. I'm not sure what the file format is on that. Is I think someone did say that it's a a very old file format on the 6D, um, but I'm not sure because, like I said, I don't shoot Canon, so I'm not certain about that. But I know if it's anything like the 5D Mark IV, which is just a disgusting file format for video, um, I'm not sure whether the uh, 6D has that same type format. Um, someone may yeah, be able to talk see, about that. I was that. thinking if the... If Sony, if Canon was going to put 4K in their 60 Mark II, it, it would be the motion JPEG file format. Yeah. I don't think they would put a different a different codec in there. Um, maybe they just don't have the tech yet. Maybe just they never they never really invested in the tech to put it into their cameras of that size, and they couldn't they couldn't get it to happen. I, I don't know. I mean, um, but that's where it's at. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into some of the Q and A. Snap Click is asking. Can we talk about the upcoming 16 to 35 G Master? Says he's stoked about it. Um, well, Dave, uh, since Dave's kind of already mentioned G Master's not kind of on his radar, but Dave, your thoughts on a 16 to 35 f 2.8 G Master? Yeah, it'd, it'd be a lovely. I've got the 16 to 35 f4, um, which I use, which which for me is probably going to be uh, good enough. Look. To be honest now, with, with the range of ISO that these new cameras can push, I never really have an issue with, with using the F4 version. So for me, it's probably going to be um, good. I do use that lens quite a lot uh, for wide portraiture and stuff like that. I use it as well. Um, clearly, the G Master is going to be a, a better lens, and it's probably going to be sharper. But I'm really actually quite happy with the uh, F4 version. So I probably won't update to that. Um, but it, it is an interesting lens. I'd probably, if I was going to go for one, I'd go for the 12 to, I'm not sure what, what it was, it was 12 to... 24. 
Yeah, yeah, 12 to 24. I'd probably get that one if I was getting any of those because I'd probably often need to go wider. I tend to sometimes even put the 10 to uh, 10 to 18, uh, the APS-C mm -hmm. lens on my full frame cameras and I get about 12 millimetres on that if I need to go a little bit wider. So yeah, probably that other one interests me a little bit more than the 16 to 35. Uh, or I'm still considering I may get a, a nice wide prime uh, as well, but I'm, I'm just not sure which way uh, I'll go myself. But I, I think the GM Master 16 to 35 will be beautiful. Um, yeah, it'll be great. Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, I, I haven't owned the Canon version of the F2.8. I have the 1740 F4. I, I think I'd be perfectly fine with the 16 to 35 F4 as well for what I typically shoot. I don't, I don't shoot often at that range. Um, but if I was considering a lens, I would even I would probably consider similar to you, Dave, the twelve to twenty-four. I think there'd be a little more creative interest at that twelve meter, uh, yeah. twelve millimeter range. And then I have a thirty-five millimeter lens, so it's kind of like, well, I can kind of cover some of my bases a little bit if I really needed to. Um, but f four on the wide end seems to be fine for what I what I need. All right. Yeah. Um, I Dan HD says, or I Dan HD says, is it worth to buy an eighty D right now for stills? Um, you know, it just really depends on what you're doing, in my opinion, Idan. If you are just starting out and you and you want a DSLR and you're and you're interested in the Canon system, um, an ADD is is going to be just fine. I I would probably consider what I would say is look at the glass that you're buying, and see if you can get some good quality glass with it. But that's just my thoughts on it. Uh, Dave, what would you what would you recommend, Dave? If the yeah, ADD is still still. Yeah, I'd still, uh, and you can probably get that for a reasonable, uh, you know, money sort of second hand even now. So uh, I'd probably still tend to go that way. The The main difference I've found is, is like you said, it's glass that makes the major difference with, with these cameras. If you can, if you only have a certain amount of money to spend, I would always pull back on the body a little bit and buy a bit of glass because later mm -hmm. on the, the bodies tend to be disposable, the, the lenses aren't. And that's like I'll often keep my lenses for years and years and years where I'm upgrading my camera gear every 12 months or something, but the lenses don't get upgraded like that. So spend more money on the glass and pay less for the body if you can. Maybe, if you've yeah. a Maybe you can consider a 70D. The 70D prices are fairly yeah. uh, cost effective right now. I've seen them. I don't know if you're in the US or not, but I've seen them go for about 550 or so, even on the Canon refurb store. So if you wanted like an official Canon branded camera you can get it for a decent price and save that money and buy some really good uh, some decent glass for your camera yep all right uh tag the shooter asks uh do you like the hot shoes on your sony compared to nikon or canon that you used before the sony hot shoe and flash connections are plastic and very fragile and a few friends whose hot shoes on the flashes broke um yeah, it's not it's not as good as what the Nikon had. Uh, that it's okay on the camera. Um, it, it's the flashes. Like I have the HLV sixties, which are the Sony flashes, and they're the high end flash, and it is all plastic. So if you did drop it, I actually have dropped one of those. It fell off my strap and hit the floor and cracked. I oh, know it was on the desk. It was actually on a desk and fell down, and it cracked the um, flash adapter. So I couldn't use the flash that day. Luckily, I've got three of them. So, but um, it did smash that. Uh, hot shoe adapter on the on the flash itself so they are very flimsy the other thing that i don't like as much is that it is a multi-purpose hot shoe in that they have little sensors at the end little um electronic um bits at the end that plug in which the nikon and stuff don't have so it's definitely not as robust as what um the nikon had but there's obviously reasons why sony have done that because you can have other attachments on the top of the camera like microphones and, and other things that tap into that uh, digital aspect of the camera, uh, but yeah, it's definitely not as robust as what the Nikon was. Um, no, I agree. I'm just going to take Dave's word for it. Uh, <laughs> this year. All right, uh, Dave Sincere has got a question. Um, uh, what is the must-have gear when you go to a wedding or model shoot? So. Oh. Tough one. I think a camera is well, important. Uh, other than the camera, I'm yeah, it is. <laughs> Must have gear for me. If I had to take one lens, for instance, it would be the 85 millimeter Batis. I love that lens, the 1.8. That would be the main lens for me. Uh, the second lens would be the 35 1.4. I use that an awful lot as well. And the other third bit of gear that I take 
everywhere to every shoot, which really is just, I just um, adore, is my pro photo units that for the off-camera flash. They, they are just awesome um, strobes that I use in every modeling shoot that I do. It just, it, and you know, it just takes the photography to another level. They're the three things that I'd, I'd say that I have to take to every shoot. All right. Um, Keith Alexander Bailey asks, on the Canon 80D, or sorry, the Canon 60 Mark II, they talk about digital stabilization and the sensor. And my concern is, it, is it going to crop when using that feature? Yes, it will. It's the same yeah. as using Final Cut. It, it does the same thing. That That's where the Sony are more advanced because the sensor moves, whereas this is, all it's doing, it's enlarging the, uh, the, the area to allow for that movement. So it has to do some sort of cropping depending on how much you're actually moving. It is exactly the same if you're doing that than as if you've taken it into to final cut and then um, done the image stabilization in there as well. I mean, it's I suppose it's okay to have it, but really if you're talking about having a decent system, it has to be a mechanical system like what the Olympus has, the, the, the Panasonic has, and, and also the Sony have. Um, you can't beat that mechanical uh, stabilization yeah, I agree. It is going to crop. It is basically like a warp stabilizer, similar. I, yeah. I mean, like I said, I haven't. I personally have not used it, so I haven't seen it personally firsthand. But from what I recall, even the I think it was the EOS M5. Was it the EOS M5 or was the? Uh, yes, I had the same that, system. Yeah, it had the same, basically the same concept. It actually crops in slightly yeah. when it's when you're trying to compensate yeah. for the switching, so um, for the stabilization. Uh, Mr. Purple asked, uh, at the 6D Mark II price of about 2000 US, body only, would you be better off getting a Panasonic GH5 for the same price? You get 4K at 60 FPS, IBIS, and more. Um, I think if you're, it might, the way I look at it is if you're in the cinematography industry and you need that, and you're shooting a lot of video, and I, I've, I've never shot, I, I, never sh I never really shot photos with my GH4, so, but I think if you're heavier on the photography, the video side, I think the GH5 would be a much better option, uh, considering its price. But, um, but Dave, what do you think? Yeah, look, I, yeah, I agree with that. The issue for me still with those cameras is the sensor size. Um, it's that trying to get the the decent bokeh or, or out of focus area on those. You, you, it, it becomes an issue with lenses for me because you have to shoot so wide open. What I think you have to shoot one point one to get like a 2.8 um, on a full frame size camera. So, you, you know, it, it, it's a problem. And noise can be a little bit of an issue in those ones. The GH5 apparently is a really good camera. I had the GH4 too um, as well, but I sold that because I ended up going to Sony and I didn't need it any longer. But um, I'd probably tend to go for the Canon in, in the, if you're just doing photos. Video, definitely the GH5. Yeah. Um, I, Dan HD asked, um, if you only if you had no camera equipment and you only had twelve hundred dollars, what camera would you buy mainly for stills photography? Ooh, twelve hundred dollars. Uh, well, I'd probably get the A six three hundred, but that's probably what I'd get. I'm sure you could get that now for that money. Um, like I said, I love those cameras. I love the A six three hundred and the A six five hundred. Um, I probably would go that way. I think uh, if I was starting. Um, I'm not sure what the price is new of those now. I mean, even the A6500, you've got that, haven't you, Danny? You're quite happy with, with that as well, aren't you? The 6500 or the 6300? You, you've got the 6000 as well, haven't you? I have the 6000. It's it's good too. Like the image quality out of that yeah. is pretty good too. Um, th those are just really, they're really solid cameras. It's just, you know, like I said, I, I, have, I deal with the overheating thing. I don't know about everybody else. But other than that, I mean, those are pretty good cameras in that regards. Um, as far as what I would get, if I was looking in Canon, the Sony system, I guess I would consider similar cameras. I would look at the 6500 or 6300 as a initial camera. All right, let's see here. We're, we're kind of winding down. Let's see if we've got any more questions before we kind of finish off here. Um, I think that's, I think that's, Pretty much it. Okay, there's one more I think here. Let's see. Uh, Moments of Rami says, "Hey guys, I've been checking out the Olympus Pro lenses for Micro Four Thirds, and they're made amazingly well. 
And I wish that Olympus made them for E-mount. What do you guys think? I, I haven't used any of the Olympus Pro lenses, unfortunately. Um, but no, like the Zuko, Zuko series type lenses. Uh, yeah, I haven't personally used them. Yeah. The Panasonic uh, and the Olympus lenses are very good. I mean, they actually are. They do make really, really good lenses. Um, but yeah, I can't answer that either. There was one other question too that Dave Sincere asked me. Uh, he just said, would you say there's a lot of competition in Australia as in, as in other photographers? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I suppose, look, Dave, yes, there is. Look, we're the same as everywhere else um, in, the, in the world. Uh, the difference is you just have to make sure that you're not trying to combat other photographers in the, in the similar reign. Like, for instance, I'm more high-ended, um, and I will never put things on at the same price as what I call the, the bottom dwellers who are offering, you know, $100 for, for 20,000 images that they'll give and stuff like that. You have to target your market, and that's the, the trick with this. Um, like I said, I, I prefer to sit on the middle or the high end, but there is lots of competition. But I can tell you there's far more competition for the uh, beginning photographers and the cheap photographers than there is for the more higher ended ones, but you have to stick to your guns. But yeah, there's like, with the same as everywhere, there's, there's massive competition uh, around. But once you get a name for yourself, um, it, it's not an issue any longer. And like I said, I have as much work as I could ever take on. So for me, I, I'm comfortable and making a very good living out of it. But yeah, it's tough for new people starting, that's for sure. All right. Uh, I do apologize that there were some questions that we did miss on the stream, but. Uh... I think we're going to call it a day here for the Monday Live. Once again, thank you so much for everyone that was able to make it out today to the live stream. If you can, if you if it doesn't hurt, if you could give the video a thumbs up, if you did enjoy the stream today, um, and I'm hoping in the future we can get Dave back on here as uh, as another guest. He, I've been uh, really enjoyed our time here. Uh, and I'm going to give the final word uh, for Dave. Dave, if there's anything you'd like to say before we go this evening. No, I'm just, um, thank, thanks uh, for the opportunity, Danny. It's been great. I've really loved it. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you guys. Like I said, I love the up and coming photographers like you guys. So I've really appreciated it going. I love to follow you. And like I said, everyone should be supporting these young photographers that are coming up because, um, you know, the world's ahead of them and they've got so much knowledge and things to share. So, you know, I really appreciate it. And I, like I said, I just love sort of growing with you guys. And it's, it's been great. Obviously, if you can uh, give me a follow on my YouTube channel, if you, if you yeah, can, because uh, I'm posting some good things as well. Um, but yeah, apart from that, just want to say thank you so much, Danny, for the opportunity to you know have a chat with you. I've had a ball. Yeah, again, thanks so much, Dave. Again, folks, uh, I posted a link to Dave's YouTube channel on the stream. Uh, again, just search him up, David Osler. You'll find him on YouTube. Give him a subscribe. He's got some really good content. He's a really underrated guy on YouTube. He does some really great stuff with behind the scenes that I really enjoy. Um, but once again, thanks guys for joining us on Monday Live, and we'll see you again later. Bye. Thanks, guys.